Hello and welcome to the Manchester is Red podcast. My name is Stephen Rilston and I'm your host today and we are recording on a snowy Friday afternoon depending where you are. I've not got much snow here because I'm close to the city centre but my two colleagues do. I don't think Ty does actually but Samuel certainly does hence his attire and his mum's favourite jumper. Samuel yeah. how are you today? <laughs> oh, very well thank you yeah she, she actually the other uh, very thick jumper similar to this the crew neck one she, she did live literally buy me but she didn't buy, purchase this one for me so yeah she's clearly got a good eye for uh, for knitwear this time of year <laughs> i'm a fan i'm a fan i'll give you my approval and tyrone like how it. are you i like it I, i'm good thank you Stephen. i'm good yeah no no snow in the um the metropolis of of bolton or near bolton so uh so yeah we've we've escaped the worst of it being at a uh, ground level compared to where samuel is and of course there was a game last night where you were both at Old Trafford in the press box and there was a sprinkle of snow at Old Trafford throughout the game it came down little sp- splatterings throughout in Samuel it was uh, a 4-1 score in the end after Anfield they needed to respond in the, that was a terrible game an embarrassment a, a terrible disaster performance but to come out four days later to defeat Betis in that fashion that was pretty impressive wasn't it because there was a lot of scrutiny over the last few days a lot of questions and the dressing room responded didn't they 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 not only needed to win they needed to win quite well and and Ty was saying as half time loomed how Betis had nothing about them and United should be beating them quite easily putting them to the sword and he he was completely right but then United had that jittery period towards the end of the half and could have actually ended it 2-1 2-1 down they were a bit too frivolous with their uh, opportunities in the final third Fekos was either offside or not great with his finishing uh, when when Rashford had that chance when Anthony played the ball to him the ball was behind him so it was still a night where you came away from it as, as good as they were in the second half where they probably should have won by probably four, five or six goals. They, they had that many chances and, and they, they were especially dominant in the second half and dominant for the majority of the first. It was just that last 10 or 15 minute spell that was sparked by Perez's goal. But I suppose the, the identity of the goal scorers was, uh, went some way to exercise in uh, the demons from, from Anfield as well in that Rash, all four of them transgressed in one way or another, whether it was Rashford miscuing that shot at nil-nil, uh, Anthony was particularly feckless, Fernandez led, well sorry he didn't lead, he, he just it was his lack of leadership that was quite appalling and uh, Vegos maybe worst of all touching the this is Anfield side I, I'm certainly not buying his his explanation. As, as I said to you, it was like all these Tory MPs coming out and trying to make excuses for Boris Johnson rocking up to all these parties conveniently, and how I, I think one said that he was ambushed with cake. It was it was almost as bad <laughs> as that, really. Uh, but I was I was I was I think it was you know you I think everyone in the stadium was still pleased for Vegas when he did score because he he puts a shift in and uh, he'd he'd earned that goal in the end and where it's now for where it ended 4-1 on the night they've they're they're all but through to the to the quarterfinals I think the United officials can be forgiven for planning for two European midweeks in in April and it's only the second time all season that they've scored four goals in a game under Ten Hag as well so the, the timing of that must have been especially pleasing for him We'll start with uh, focusing in on Anthony then, Ty, because he scored the kind of goal that you know restored the lead and what a finish it was, cutting inside and finding that corner. We know he's capable of that and I think most of his goals have been that this season, haven't they, when he's cut in and produced a stunning finish. Um, but I think it's fair to say he was quite poor in the first half. He's very quiet and he's probably the most likely candidate to be replaced at the break. Obviously, he wasn't and he, he came out and scored the goal in the 52nd minute. Is it fair to say that kind of performance maybe epitomises his time at United where he's not sustained the performance for the 90 minutes but we see these flashes of brilliance we see what he's capable of but I think the next challenge for him now is to do that across a full game would you agree with that assessment? Uh, yeah 100% to be honest I think that's that's spot on and, and Ten Hag touched on that post-match as well really and it's been noticeable that Ten Hag's been very very honest in his appraisals of, of Anthony recently in mm. terms of what more he has to do and how much he has to improve and he does have to become a, a more consistent threat. I think what what that goal does show is that you know it, it, it's pretty clear now that he is he is left footed. In case you hadn't noticed, and <laughs> he can pretty much only use his left foot. But that doesn't have to be a hindrance. It, the goal was almost Robin esque, and he did you know he did the same move through his entire career, and it never really stopped him. And when you can produce finishes of that quality, it doesn't have to be 
a hindrance. What he needs to do is is learn to kind of use his right foot at times. I've mentioned before when he's when he's trying to run down the wing, every touch is with the inside of his left foot, and it just pushes him closer and closer and closer to the touchline until he's nowhere to go but turn back and, and go to the fullback or go into midfield. And you know, looking at looking at Ten Hag's quotes in the press conference yesterday, talking about. Um, Anthony needed to be braver and I think he said to use his speed more often which is interesting because you watch him play and I don't think anyone would think I mean watch him at United he is that quick because you never see him breaking away from defenders really or, or bursting in behind but I think that is maybe partly a confidence thing and partly that we just don't see him in those situations because he is he is a little bit hesitant he is a little bit too one-dimensional when he's when he's pushed against the touchline um, so he, you know he does need to become a more consistent threat in games at the moment there's too much there's too there's too many long spells where he does just just go missing basically and, and doesn't contribute at all and the other thing which both, both me and Samuel have mentioned recently is that he has seems to have a lot better partnership with with Wamba Saka it's a a strange um combination I, I've written a piece on it this lunchtime and basically said in the intro it just it it should not work as a partnership you've got a introverted grafting English defender who's doesn't really got the trust of Ten Hag against what is essentially Ten Hag's pet project, who's an extroverted Brazilian showman, and they've got absolutely nothing in common, but seem to have a better partnership than Anthony does with Dallo. And I don't really know why that is. I don't know if I think maybe there's a degree that Dallo sort of occupies spaces that Ten Hag that Anthony likes to use at times, but it does feel like he plays better with Wan Bissaka there. And I thought United were, were better in the second half. Um, for Wan Bissaka's presence last night, Dallo's been sloppy since the World Cup. He's, he's not had his not reached the same heights he had in the first half of the season. And Wan Bissaka's getting better and better, really. And it was noticeable how aggressive he was as a, kind of a running threat from right back last night, and, and really making some some strong runs into the final third. And I think at the moment he is he is suiting Anthony more. And it's an argument that if you want to get more out of Anthony, perhaps you need to start. You know, give give Wambasaka that right back shirt for four or five games and, and see how that partnership develops over a, a longer period of time. Would it surprise you both if I said Anthony has eight goal contributions this season in twenty eight appearances compared to Rashford last season, who was widely derided and rightly so, and he got seven goal contributions and thirty two appearances? Do you think there's anything in that? Because obviously we were everyone slated Rashford last season and rightly so. He was a shadow of himself and he was a player very low on confidence, did not impact games. But Anthony's obviously going to finish the season ahead of that tally, isn't he? But probably not too far ahead. It, he's, he's got a better tally than him though, Steve. <laughs> so, in few, well, that's, 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 that's my point, point Samuel. So, comparison so, Im- immediately. No. I, I think with I think with Anthony, he gets cut a bit of slack because he's come from Ajax and unless you're very naive he I don't think anybody was expecting him to come straight here and, and set the world alight and uh, just I, I'd barely seen him play but you you see some of the clips you hear about his personality and just the fact that he's come from the Eredivisie there was always going to be an element of patience I suppose he was slightly a victim of his own success and that he scored in those first three Premier League games which I mean, I don't. I, I didn't think it was that meaningful at the time, but at the weekend you saw this big song and dance about Mohamed Salah being Liverpool's all-time leading Premier League goalscorer, which is a completely pointless statistic, but to a lot of people it, it means a lot. And I suppose with Ansi, that was that was something that people made a song and dance about because he was the first United player to do that, or one of the first United players to to have done that. But as, as we go back, we, we went back to that. Our, if we go back to that Arsenal debut, I think we were all quite critical of him. And that other than the goal, he didn't really do a lot. Um, the second goal against City, you know, that they were 4 0 down at the time, and it was what he didn't do that day that was more relevant than, than the goal he scored to make it 4 1 in a game that United soon found themselves 6 1 down. And uh, the, the Everton game, he did play quite well in, but as, as Ty just touched upon, it was I think that was maybe the first time and one of the first occasions that Ten Hag was possibly more critical of Anthony after scoring in a game than he was uh, praiseworthy of him. With with Rashford, he's, he's he's got the experience and he had the experience of playing for United, but I think it's you know we've, we've, it's been covered chapter and verse why last season went as badly as it did uh, for him, even though he actually made. Quite a, quite a decent return when he did initially come back into the team. 
No, that's fair enough. The point I was just trying to make is it's regarded as obviously the worst season of Rashford's career, and rightly so, last year. Yeah, Anthony's probably not going to finish too far ahead of him uh, in regard you've, you've to also made the mistake of by the end of the season. You've also made contributions, and you would hear yeah, that, Samuel. Goal. I knew you'd hear that. I was, I was <laughs> laughing as a Roy. Yeah, Anthony's, was like, got, Anthony's got seven goals this season. Rashford seven goals, one goals, assist. Goals last season. The clocks, yeah. the clocks haven't gone forward yet. You know, there's, there's time no. to reach double. But it's, it's a wider point as well. It should be. Go on, Ty. Sorry. What, I mean, what that stat does show, you have mentioned goal contributions there of, of eight, but seven of them are goals. He's got one assist in 28 games. He needs to create doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I did see the other day. I know, um, just just to continue to, to wind Samuel up more, I did see a tweet <laughs> yesterday about his expected assist, oh. which I know is, is a, <laughs> XA, I think, this time. Um, <laughs> but it did say that his expected assists in terms of the quality of chances he's creating is one every 25 games which for an 85 million pound right winger is horrific really he's got he's got to be more creative and he he does produce the odd brilliant finish but it's hard to remember him creating any chances really i mean he should have laid one on a plate for fred last night when he went for the shot instead of squaring it but you watch him in games and he he doesn't create a lot in terms of chances for for other teammates so that is is definitely an area he needs to work on interesting enough the the chance that he did create i think was actually from the left I think just after 20 minutes, he was on that side for round five. And he, uh, for yeah, for he did, but it was a little bit of decent yeah. crossing. Yeah, mm. so it was actually on the opposite side. Um, if we move on then, we'll look at Fernandes as well, because he was criticised in the aftermath of the, the Anfield defeat tie. Um, his attitude was disappointing. Gary Neville obviously had a go at him on commentary. Um, it was later revealed that he did not actually request to be substituted, or that was the understanding. Um, what did you think about his performance? Because for me, he was probably the best player on the pitch last night. And a lot was said in the media, a lot was discussed in the pre-match press conference. I think his name was discussed the most on Wednesday. So to come out like that and, and respond like that, it's that was impressive, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was. And it's been noticeable. It's been kind of a, a closing of the ranks um, this week. Fernandez and, sorry, Ten Hag and Rashford were both, both praised him an awful lot in, in the press conference. Ten Hag did leave a little bit of room in saying everyone... You know, everyone makes mistakes and, and he's got to learn, but it was noticeable how much they praised him. And, you know, you mentioned Neville there. I think for all of Fernandez's faults on, on Sunday, it, it, you know, he's not the type of player he's ever going to ask to come off in a game. Um, you know, he's, he, he's not that, that type of person. If anything, it means too much to him because the antics you see on Sunday are driven by that hatred of losing and, and the desire to win. And he just channels it in a poor way where he essentially loses his head and becomes more and more childish, basically. Um, but that's because he, he he hates losing so much, and we've seen, you know, we saw that in his first few weeks at the club under Solskjaer, when he used to hammer teammates on the pitch for passing the ball five yards either side of him. So that's not really a, a new trait in his game. Um, and it was noticeable that when he came out last night, his name was the first one sung by fans. So it's clear that teammates, manager, fans, there has kind of been a closing of the ranks around him. Um, he did have a very good game. It, you know, it's. It, Someone was saying, I saw someone tweet that he had, had a hand in the first three goals. I think it's very generous to say he had a hand in the first <laughs> goal, given that cross was absolutely dreadful. What does expected um, assist say, though, Ty? What does it Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an expected <laughs> cutout, that one, and it was cut out, but <laughs> Rashford was in the right place. Trying um, to calculate that, Gaff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, but yeah, he improved. Anyway, it, he improved a lot after setting up Anthony's goal as well. and you know, he didn't have to do a lot to set that up. It was a fairly simple pass. He did do well to to win the ball and keep the ball in midfield, but his best spell was probably in the 10 or 15 minutes after that. I think he won the corner from which he scored with a good low cross and that there was that spell there where he was where he was everywhere really. So I think it was it was a good response, but you still see that um I I'd written I, I was doing the five things we learned piece and I'd put one of them about Fernandez and had mentioned after maybe an hour, 65 minutes how He'd almost he toned it down as well. There'd been very few confrontations. There'd been no arguing with the referee, and then all of a sudden he flies in on Claudio Bravo. Got pretty pretty lucky with that. I would yeah. I would say it wasn't a great. It was not a great challenge. Then he has the cheek to go and scream in Bravo's face to suggest he's he's making the most of it. Seemingly he goes and has a big argument with one of the best defenders, and it's like yeah yeah. You know, you're, you're never going to change. You know, you're never going to change. Um, so yeah, so that that paragraph had to be ripped up pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> but it was, um, you know, it was a, a much better performance and a, and a perfect response. But I think with Fernandez, he needs to lead. He needs to learn. Uh, he needs to lead better. Sorry, when things aren't going well, um, which at the moment for United is an issue because they do have this habit of every 20 games or so throwing in a, 
a mad one and that's that's where he needs to learn that he he needs to be the leader slowing the game down and, and keeping cool heads in that point rather than making it worse but in games like last night he's he's always very good and, and a good leader I think the Gary Neville point is relevant because the the misfortune those who are watching it on TV have is that when these United Liverpool games come around the partisan punditry is at its absolute worst and a lot of broadcasters now think that that's acceptable like whether it's Alan Shearer or Ian Wright or Gary Neville or Jamie Carragher whichever player is there it's like they're they're almost there as a as a fan I can't stand the whole we've got Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville on commentary and here's Gary Neville looking miserable here's Jamie Carragher looking miserable uh, I mean the, the the roar that greeted Sancho's goal at the start of the season against Liverpool it's blighted because you can hear Gary Neville's shriekish celebration now if you're in a gantry you're not there to celebrate if you're a pundit you're not there to be partisan you've got to be you've got to be impartial Gary Neville failed to do that Carragher failed to do that. Graham Sooner certainly failed to do that as well. Um, Kelly Cates, the presenter, failed to do that. Roy Keane has been pretty bad for it as well this season. United should have used that. And that's where it came to a head because you've got Gary Neville making this accusation that Fernandez is saying he wants to come off. It was completely baseless. And if you actually look at the footage, I don't know how he came to the conclusion that Fernandez is thinking is saying I want to come off if anything he's probably he might have been saying to them um oh what what's the point making a substitution now like we're six nil down or whatever it is and you know United had their explanation for it uh that that he wanted to know what his positional change was he was he was obviously really wound up as as anyone would be if they're losing six nil but really the club should be using this as an opportunity now to ro- ro- you know push back on the the t- tv broadcasters tell these former players who want to be like journalists a lot of times they they want to come to carrington and interview the players or interview ten hag go back to basics do you know do what a pundit is good at just be impartial in, try and inform people give hard hitting opinions and don't don't I mean don't be a cheerleader. Micah Richards is really bad at it as well. And as I said, I thought that was that was really poor from from Gary Neville that he made that accusation. He he's wound up because everyone knows he hates Scousers and he's seen United getting thumped at Liverpool. But there was no measured commentary there from him, and it seems like quite a lot of United supporters are getting wound up by how he commentates on them anyway. Uh, but you know we're in the privileged position where we don't have to listen to that. But even just listening back to some of the analysis, I can see why a lot of fans, whether you're a United fan or a Liverpool fan or just a, a neutral uh, tuning in, I, I don't know why you'd have any time to for that kind of content. But unfortunately, that's the way of the world. There's all this clamour for content, which is such a dreadful, dreadful word. But unfortunately, the the rights holders have, have jumped onto that bandwagon as well. Very well said, but we'll end it there for part one because I'm probably going to get sacked for not going to the ad break sooner. We'll be back in a moment for part two where we will have a dedicated section on expected goals. So we're back for part two and as promised, unfortunately we aren't actually going to discuss expected goals, but we are going to discuss uh, Wild Weghorst Samuel in a bit more depth because you would have to have a, a heart of stone really not to be happy for him when that goal went in. We all know he's a limited striker, we've said it at Lemps on this podcast, um, but to get his goal, he worked his socks off, um, you had to be happy for him didn't you? And as you said earlier in your earlier answer, it was well deserved on the night. It certainly was, and what you can't um, you can't say that he lacks is is commitment or work rate. He's for someone who's thirty, who's you know been playing at lower levels uh, in in certainly this season in Turkey, and he spent a long time in, in Germany as well. He's he's not really had a lot of Premier League football for such a such an experienced footballer. But he started the 15 games he's been he's been available for now, and there was this great stat that Ian Whittle uh, sent round to all of us this morning, which was that um, as of tomorrow, you everyone will be able to say, and you can pretty much say it now, Anthony Marshall has started 15 times for United in the last two years. Veghorst has started 15 times for United in the last two months, which is just another remarkably damning statistic against Marshall, which is why United want to sell him in the summer. And Veghorst may be an inferior footballer, 
He may not score as many goals as Martial, but he's durable, he's fit, he makes himself available, he can be flexible as well. United have had a bit of joy from playing him in, in a deeper position, but it was the right thing to do against Betis, uh, sticking him back up front, because even though he may not get, he may not take one of those chances, you've got Fernandes in his best position, you've got Rashford in his best position, and moving the shapes around just didn't work at Anfield on Sunday, taking Rashford away from Alexander-Arnold and just taking him away from his best his best position. We've said this for for many years now that Rashford is at his best from, from the left wing and if you move him away from there, you, you're taking a bit of a risk and, and obviously it, it did backfire in the Liverpool game. With Vekos, we've as we've said, ad nauseum, he has been overplayed, he has been overexposed, but that is that's that's at Marshall's door really. He's he's not made himself available. But this always happens with Marshall. When United sign a striker, whether it's Ronaldo or Cavani or Ibrahimovic or Lukaku or Veghorst, whatever their profile, whatever their pedigree, he collapses. Uh, whether it's a, a mental capitulation or a physical capitulation. And you just cannot trust him. And you can't trust Veghorst as a goal scorer, but he is at least going to be available. And it's it's some going for someone who has been playing. I mean, he was a bit part player at the World Cup as well, so he wasn't starting regularly there, but he was obviously very much on it in the in the quarterfinal against Argentina to get those two goals. So his attitude seems pretty spot on, um, provided he's playing in the right environment. I suspect, you know, what happened at Burnley, that, that not many of his teammates will have particularly fond memories of him as he was the big money mid-season, mid-season signing who was, you know, bought to try and keep them up. And I think he only ended it with with two goals for Burnley. So that, that was not a success by any stretch of the imagination. But he's he's done a creditable job overall so far for United, and um, you know again as I said earlier the, the identity of the scorers last night, whatever people may think about his uh, his, his, his tunnel antics or antic at Anfield and the the statement that he put out which was dubious to to put it politely he he put in a shift last night he was involved he was in opportunities to score. And there is a lot to like about him. It's just, unfortunately for him, the the thing that he was bought to do, he's not particularly good at, which uh, is always, you know, bound to cause an issue for Ten Hag. And he has had to, he has had to use him in different roles. But sometimes he, that that has been vindicated, and United have had some joy there. So it's he's been a he's been an okay mid-season addition. Um, so far, and I, I, I mean, certainly when he came in, I mean, how how often does a mid-season backup signing actually go on to play 15 games between January and May? Uh, sorry, start 15 games between January and May, and I don't think anybody's expecting Marshall to be taking his place against Southampton this weekend either. If we move on and look at a few negatives then, because there probably were a few from the night, we'll start with David De Gea's performance, Ty. Um, but just first, a, a bit off topic as Ty's nodding his head. How old's your lad now, Ty? Uh, three and a half. Do you reckon he could have kicked the ball better than De Gea at the end of the first half when he, when he cleared it? <laughs> Uh, quite, <laughs> it quite just, plausibly, it's, yeah. His, yeah, it starts a conversation, doesn't it? I mean, De Gea's distribution's always been quite poor. Um, but I kind of came around to the train of thought where United could do stay with him in front of a season, stick by him, address other key positions in the summer. But nights like that really do make you think because he was really poor, wasn't he, for the ball at his feet. And after that blunder at the end of the first half, he looked like he was short on confidence every time he got the ball. He looked like he was going to make a mistake. Yeah, he did. Um, you know, he, he, he was he was all over the show, wasn't he, first half? I mean, it, it wasn't a great night for, for playing out from the back and, and kicking it short, but some of his, even his long kicks, I mean, there were four in the first half. The, the one that went straight to the Betis midfield early on, um, then one that he, he sprayed kind of towards me and Samuel in the press box towards that stand. And from the wide pitch angle we had, it was impossible to tell which player he was trying to pick out, to be honest. There was no one near it unless he's seen a steward in a red shirt or something like that. It was a mystery which which player he was aiming for there. Then he tried to find Dallow kind of near the halfway line and it fell 10 yards short to, to Whammy. And then, of course, the the worst um, the, the worst of the lot just before half-time when there was there was two players probably five yards either side of, of Whammy, but from 15 yards away, De Gea just played it straight to the winger's feet. It was incomprehensible, really. And he was... 
very fortunate that Perez's effort hit the post. It it would have been, you know, the, to go back to the first the first question of this podcast and United's response, that was the moment that that kind of ten or fifteen minutes for half time was where it was noticeable that they were a team whose confidence was fragile after after Sunday. That I mean, conceded out of nowhere, suddenly you could tell they were questioning themselves. They weren't quite, you know, that there was doubt starting to appear in in that spell. And if they'd have gone in two one behind from a mistake, you wonder how the rest of the game would have panned out because they could have spent half time thinking, hey, here we go again, I can't I can't believe this has happened. We've dominated this game and we're two one down. But it, he you know he got away with it and second half it, it, it wasn't as noticeable because Betis barely had an attack. Um but yeah, you know it's it's clearly an issue. Ten Hag Ten Hag did say afterwards he, he, he couldn't ignore it um in, in that game in particular and it, it is a problem for for United. You know, it's it's partly why this contract situation is is still going on because he's he's the best paid goalkeeper in the world but in, you know he, he cannot he knows he cannot sign an extension on those terms and United know he cannot sign an extension on those terms but h- how much of a wage cut he takes and how long that contract is for is probably not particularly easy to to come to terms with he, he said numerous times I think he said to, to, to Samuel when we all spoke to him on pre-season tour he wanted to finish his career at United but you do feel that if not this summer then next summer someone is going to be signed as competition for him and you know the, the name that, that is doing the rounds pretty regularly at the moment is, is David Raya who seems yeah, I'm not a fan to leave of Brentford not at some point he's going to leave but, Brentford I mean, it'd be he's ironic if well. he's going to leave Brentford it would be ironic if the guy who's taken his place in the Spain squad now takes his place in <laughs> in the United team and I think the thing with Raya I always go back to is I remember when Brentford played I think it was one of the Liverpool games last year and, and Jurgen Klopp said he should wear 10 on his back rather than one his, his passing and his distribution was that good and you know that that's clearly the, the the negative with De Gea's game, and you do feel at some point Ten Hag is is going to have to address it, and it it becomes an issue when he's on the kind of money he is, and for you know for to to, to take a substantial pay cut, he might be looking for a longer deal that gives him a bit more security, but it's not going to be an easy one to to do, and and you you do look at last night's performance and think, do you need to kind of bring forward plans to to bring someone in who who can challenge him for as 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 reliable a goalkeeper as Tom Eaton is for as good a pro as he is he's, he's clearly not someone who's going to take De Gea's place in that team and, and you probably do need someone who, who can at least lay down a, a bit more of a challenge to him Oh, for all that Riaz passing is brilliant as you've just mentioned I've personally got my doubts about whether he's a, a top mm. goalkeeper or Manchester United yeah, yeah, calibre goalkeeper as, as, goal, as, like, goalkeeper as a fellow goalie type what would you do? In, you know, with yeah, United where, is it a priority um, lads that's what I'm trying to say is it a priority should it be this summer this because the issue. that's the question you have to ask after last night yeah I mean it, it, it shouldn't be this summer but the problem is if you exercise the option on De Gea's contract I mean I'm, I'm not doing, I can't do quick maths here but 375 grand times 12 months you know that's a what's that 30 million something like that for a season yeah. less than that I don't know it's it's a lot of money, isn't it? it? It's it's money you could basically release him and sign another goalkeeper if if it comes to that. If you can't come to terms over a, a new contract, and I think that's maybe the where it's if it gets into May and this is still going on, you maybe reach the point where you say right, it would just let him go because I I don't think it's worth spending nineteen and a half million. million. Nineteen and a half is it? Yeah. I don't think it's worth spending nineteen and a half million on wages to keep him for one more year. Um, to be honest, I think you'd be better off saving that. And, and trying to sign someone else, but if he, think, you know, if he does agree issue, to say a new two-year deal, I'd keep him. I think the other issue they would have as well, if he's on the existing contract, his salary would go up next season because it's gone down this season because of the Champions League uh, course, failure yeah, to qualify yeah. uh, the twenty-five percent reduction. So actually, he will, without signing a new contract, he will be on more money next season. So he's on. He's yeah. taken a slight hit this year by what he's. 290 grand he might be on at the moment but that will that will go back up next season if or when United are, are back in the Champions League two words then chaps Dean Henderson dare I say it 
Bridges does he still have a future? Two, two other, other words. Well, we had that conversation yeah, I mean, when it happened we, the, earlier in the season. I think the bridges can be repaired on that one. I think the, uh, the nuclear <laughs> option was, was exercised by, by Dean Henderson uh, in the summer. Nothing surprises me in football. Nothing would surprise. That wouldn't surprise us, honestly. Have, I mean, he would, he would need to win back his... Him to have him on loan at, at Ajax as well. And they they'd a, mm-hmm. I think they actually spoke to each other for the first time in January during a, a video call when Ten Hag pretty much said, look, we'd, we'd like you back. I, I thought that was very naive of Ten Hag given he, he clearly underestimated Dean Henderson's pers- personality but also <laughs> the fact that he's, he was playing regularly for Forrest at the time but he's I mean he's in a bit of a he's on a bit of a sticky wicket at the moment with his, his injury and Caelan Alvas has come in and, and has done quite well for Forrest so when Henderson is fit again which looks like it's going to be at the start of Next month, Steve Cooper's got a decision as to whether he continues with Navas or whether he puts Henderson back in for the run-in. Mm. Is Dean Henderson the most confident man in Britain? Uh, That's one word for it. <laughs> well, one, I could have said one, one, else, but... <laughs> one of the most confident, definitely. <laughs> He's certainly up yeah. there. He's certainly um, up there. Um, Samuel, another negative, of course, was, was Dallow. He was brought off at half time. We've discussed him in the, we've discussed in the last few weeks, really, and his, his battle with Wamba Saka and, and kind of what's going on at right back. I think it's fair to say he's, he's not playing at the levels he was earlier in the season. He went to the World Cup, obviously, picked up an injury, didn't he? Um, came back and, and picked up another hamstring problem. And he, he's not really looked like the same player. Um, Tenog kind of conceded that at half time, brought on Wamba Saka. Um, we obviously got Southampton at the weekend on Sunday afternoon. Is it as simple as now the, the scales are tipping in Wamba Saka's favour and he should start on Sunday? I think he should start, but there have been probably probably in the last four games I've probably selected Wambasaka in my team and for, for our uh, week, weekly or sorry matchly panel, and he's not appeared in it. D- Dallo is the more rounded right back. He's got more attributes. He's he's a more attack minded right back. I mean, the best cross from the right hand side at Anfield was was Dallo's cross for Fernandez in in the first half. Referring back to. Anthony's lack of creativity earlier or, or, or creating chances but unfortunately for Dallo that, that injury at the World Cup seems to have hit him for six he was playing very well at the World Cup he, he ousted João Cancelo and that injury I think was the first time he'd got injured in over two years when he was on loan at AC Milan uh, th- th- some players made that very questionable uh, I mean questionable moral decision to go on holiday in December 2020 when the pandemic was still rife he didn't he was uh, borderline reclusive unless he had to go to the training ground he had a gym there uh, he-, he didn't he didn't fraternise as much not that you could do because he didn't want to risk getting COVID he didn't get COVID at all and he's given how injury prone he was in his first couple of years at United his lack of injuries in the last two and a half years or so has been extremely impressive and going to Milan the, the biggest benefit for him was that not only did he become a better defender, but he became fitter. And everyone has, has heard the tales about the Milan lab and how it can extend the shelf life of players. And obviously, Ibrahimovic is still going there. And clearly, Dallo has come back to England a much fitter defender and he's he sorted himself out in that sense. So it would have been a particular blow to have got injured at the time he did at the World Cup and then to have got injured so quickly when he came back into the United team against Charlton. But it it just does not reflect well on you when in four sorry in two of your last starts you've been substituted uh, at half time for for the other right back it's it's quite apparent that ten hag prefers dallo and he was certainly one of the best full backs in europe um prior to the world cup and going into the world cup his his form was excellent and he was certainly one of the most improved players at united but he needs to get back to that level and he's still not able to get back to that level. He doesn't have a particularly good understanding with Anthony, which is, is surprising given that you've got two Portuguese speakers there. wan doesn't speak and Anthony doesn't speak English. Or certainly, I've not heard him speak English yet. They seem to get on like a house on fire when they... Um, you know that they're playing on the same pitch and on the same side, so it's it's strange how football works. You'd have thought that Dallo and and Anthony would have been a pretty good compatible partnership, but they're they're still yet to to truly hit it off. And with with Southampton this weekend, it still wouldn't surprise me if Dallo starts purely because United are going to have the majority of, the, of possession. They're going to need another outlet. 
uh, going forward. It's better to have two attack-minded fullbacks rather than one. That said, Wambisaka has made some progressive strides on that front in recent weeks, and like most of the fullbacks at United now, he is moving into midfield at times when they've got the ball to try and push the other midfielders forward and give them an extra body up in attack and so he's he's at he's trying to add that string to his bow and he's doing pretty decently at it but it still it still doesn't bode well for him that he's he's not started in these last four games when he was certainly very unlucky not to start in in the majority of them maybe that's why anthony and wan basaka link up quite well then because if anthony can't speak english and wan basaka rarely rarely exactly. speaks and says nothing at all it's just a silent right side isn't it <laughs> silent yeah. and deadly. I, I, I speak um, to you well, all the time Stephen, and, and we absolutely <laughs> hate each other don't we we, we can't i was gonna say unfortunately for you samuel unfortunately <laughs> for you you have to speak to us <laughs> uh, we'll leave it there for part three we'll be back in a moment for some southampton chat Now, Ty, there's obviously a big game on Sunday afternoon. Oh, well, another word you could probably use for big. It should be pretty straightforward for United, really. Ooh. Southampton are struggling at the bottom of the Premier League. They've sacked two managers already this season. They've got an interim manager in charge now, Ruben Seller. So what are your expectations for the game? We've just kind of talked about what changes could be made with, with Juan Bissaka and Dallo. Do you reckon the team's pretty set in stone with the exception of right back? Or what would you tweak anything going into the game? I think it probably is pretty much set in stone. I think we know by now that Tanag very rarely makes makes changes. Um, you know, he, he tends to play the same team. It was we haven't really touched on it, but it was interesting last night that he he played the same team and said in his post match press conference it was basically a a challenge to go out there and and put it right. So yeah, I wouldn't expect many changes. Like you say, maybe right back, um, maybe in the front three, give Sancho a start, but I I, I wouldn't think there'd be much else. Possibly Sabitzer for Fred, but. Don't know. I'm not sure that's that's particularly likely. So I won't. See, I wouldn't see many changes. And I think it's going to be a routine home win, isn't it? I mean, is that 20 games unbeaten now at Old Trafford for United? Yeah. Um, you just can't see Southampton. It seems a lot tighter. That this segment is quite boring, isn't it? Because we, we expect them to win, but that just shows you how much they've improved. Because this kind of game was a hiccup last season, wasn't it? It was a setback potentially. Yeah, it does. I mean, we 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 wouldn't we didn't expect them to win last Sunday, but we thought they might win last Sunday, and and they they. Definitely didn't, um, but yeah, they they clearly should be beating a, a team of Southampton. There's a you know there's a well known Southampton reporter in the Manchester press pack who, who gets to mention a few times on this podcast, and he was bullishly talking about the chances of a draw last night. But he seemed to think the only possibility of Southampton scoring was that De Gea has had previous problems with James Ward Prowse's free kicks. Um, you know that feels like a bit of a hail mary if that's your only your only route to a goal. You're relying on. A being far enough up the field to get a free <laughs> kick in the first place, and you know, and as good as as good as he is, he doesn't score from every one of them. Even if he has scored some very good ones against United, um, so yeah, I just I don't I don't really see there being a problem. Like I say, I think I think last night you saw the confidence return as as the game went on. I did think it was noticeable actually that when the final whistle went after he shook all the hands of seemingly every member of staff, the the one the only player to Haya spoke to on the pitch was to Haya. Um, sorry, the only player Ten Hag spoke to on the pitch himself. was Hayer. It was, yeah, yeah. I mean, he definitely <laughs> spoke to himself during the second half. Quite a lot, I think. Um, but yeah, Ten Hag basically walked off the pitch arm in arm with him, and it, it was like he kind of noticed he was the one player last night whose confidence didn't return for obvious reasons. So he was shepherding him to the tunnel and, and maybe trying to lift his lift his spirits. But the rest of them got their confidence back, and I, I can't see anything but a, a very routine home win on Sunday. To be honest. Oh, well, we've ticked it off, lads. I think it just had to be done, didn't it? I think there wasn't much to say about Southampton on Sunday, really. Um, but we'll end the podcast with a bit of transfer chat. It's a bit more exciting. Um, Samuel, you wrote the line today about Harry Kane. Um, he's been earmarked as United's prime uh, striker target in the summer. So could you tell we're a bit more... more, uh, more we are losing my mouth words there. Uh, tell we're a bit more about that interest and that story. Ten Hag just really likes him for obvious reasons. And... I remember when we had our sit down with Ten Hag in in Melbourne I asked him Look, you're signing all these players from the Eredivisie or have experience of playing in the Eredivisie uh, why is that why is that your preference and he actually said I'd prefer to sign English players but but they're expensive and United at that time they they couldn't go for top tier English players because they weren't in the Champions League they weren't a compelling sell to that that tier uh, of, of of target, if you like, um, Kane had t- 
Tottenham had qualified for the Champions League. As soon as Tottenham qualified for the Champions League, everyone knew that Harry Kane was going to be a Tottenham player this season. And Declan Rice at West Ham, he still had enough time on his contract for West Ham to be able to keep him. Coming in, as we approach this summer, things are changing. Tottenham are in disarray again. It would be they're fourth at the moment, but I'm not sure there are many Tottenham fans out there who expect them to finish the season in fourth. So that would mean they will not be in the Champions League next season. Kane is out of contract next year. I would be absolutely staggered if he signed a new Tottenham contract. I mean, he the, the most clinical piece of play from Harry Kane between now and the end of the season would be to sack his brother as his agent because his brother somehow thought it was a good idea to sign a six-year contract in 2018 and if you go back to when he signed that deal it wasn't like the glory days were just returning to Spurs they'd lost two FA Cup semi-finals in successive seasons and they had peaked under Pochettino they finished second in 2017 they finished below United in 2018 they had that fortuitous freakish run to the Champions League final in 2019 which had they somehow won it may have that might have indicated Kane's commitment but they didn't even turn up in that final. You knew Liverpool were going to, to win that final. They were completely at ease with the occasion. Tottenham, I always go back to it in the semi-final, clutching beer bottles, celebrating with supporters um, in, in Amsterdam, having just you know got that remarkable win. At that point, it was like, well, we've reached a final, great. But that's Tottenham for you. They've, they've won two League Cups in, in 30 years. United have won twice as, you know, double the amount of trophies in the last 10 years, which have been the, the doldrum years for them. Unfortunately for Tottenham, they just have this, this loser's mentality there. They've hired two serial winners in Conte and Mourinho in recent years, and their mentality is jarred with the clubs. And Levy is, has and always will be the biggest problem. The ideal scenario for Spurs would be that they sell Kane to Bayern Munich I think Levy would even take a hit on the transfer fee if it meant Kane going to Bayern. Bayern will need a striker. I mean, it's pretty remarkable what they're doing with Chupo Moteng, who, while he was at Stoke, the only thing the only thing he ever seemed to do was score a couple of goals in a draw against Man United. But his his agent deserves that malarkey agent of the year award that always seems to go to George Mendes because he got him a move to PSG, then he got him a move to Bayern Munich, and then after Bayern Munich sold Lewandowski last year rather than sign a striker they said oh no we'll go with this um, this this reject from Stoke and he actually scored against PSG in midweek as, as they qualified for the quarter finals so um, th- yeah, by, Bayern Munich getting things right it's no surprise there but they will want a new striker in the summer. Chelsea will want a new striker in the summer, but they're not going to be in a position of strength unless they somehow win the Champions League and are therefore in the Champions League next season. Even then, I, I don't think Kane would have the nerve to to cross that divide. It's it's quite a acrimonious uh, rivalry between Tottenham and Chelsea, and it seems to get a bit uh, more febrile every with, with every year as well. I, I, I'm sure Chelsea would relish the you know the, the mischievous streak in them. They'd they'd relish going for Kane, but realistically, the only Premier League club he could join in the summer is is United. And even if Tottenham do qualify for the Champions League next season, Kane's got a year left in his contract. Do they really want to lose him without get, getting the fee at some point when they could still get the best part of a hundred million pounds for him? There are few players better at doing the hardest thing in football than Kane, and that's putting the ball in the back of the net. Um, I mean, I wrote in midweek that if United did sign Kane, it would be a coup with caveats because he does turn 30 in July. He, there is a lot of wear and tear there, uh, you know, certain ankle injuries, and he's he's been playing Premier League football for nearly a decade now. That's bound to take its toll. But ultimately, he's he's one of the most intelligent forwards around in the game, and he has been for probably seven or eight years. He's a proven goal scorer. He's proven in the Premier League. You would you'd be expecting him to score thirty goals for United next season, and they do need someone who is going to come in and ease the burden on Marcus Rashford, who's had a, a terrific season, but has lacked support in um, in that sense. He's got twenty six goals this season. The next high scorer is Fernandez on eight. So they badly need someone else to come in. They they absolutely will go for a striker. And 
Kane, I, I completely understand why why Ten Hag would would favour Kane over the other contenders. There are other names that uh, Ten Hag and United like. Victor osman has been tremendous for Napoli, and uh, you know the, the other dilemma there is that Napoli also drive a hard bargain. The the biggest fees they've obtained have been for two strikers in Ensign Cavani in 2013 and Gonzalo Higuain in 2016, I think it was. So Osserman, I think, is, if anything, he's arguably worth worth more than Kane and Lazio are about to home in on their their first title and only the third title in their history. And it would, of course, be the first title uh, without the divine intervention of, of, of Diego Maradona. So Osserman is going to be hot property, but he's also going to be very, very expensive. And Napoli know when to sell. I mean, Kaladu Koulibaly, they could have got a big fee for him a few years ago, but nobody, everyone was put off from, from taking him. And when Chelsea did sign him in the summer, they probably signed him at the wrong time. So Osserman is not a slam dunk. That wouldn't be a straightforward signing at all because Napoli have, have been tremendous this season, drive a hard bargain, as I say. And they are one of the leading contenders to win the Champions League as well. They've been that impressive. And then there are a couple of other strikers who are certainly in a lower tier, I think it's safe to say. Gonçalo Ramos, Ten Hag encountered him when Ajax played Benfica last season. Mohamed Kudos has taken on a, a more... Um, a more central role at Ajax this season where they had the sales in the summer and has been doing quite well and performed quite respectably at the World Cup for Ghana. And then there are a couple of other names uh, kicking about that United are looking at and other clubs are, are looking at just because I think in the summer, I think it was Ty who might have said it or wrote it earlier in the season, but you, the, the feeling at United is that there are three or four top clubs in Europe that will want a top-class striker. You're thinking United... Bayern Munich, Chelsea, and also you're probably thinking Tottenham because there is a high chance that that Kane will go this summer. Um, going back to your Tutor Morton point there, Samuel, do you think he's got the same agent as Jermaine Genius? Because he seems to get everywhere about his town, <laughs> doesn't he? Punches yeah, massively above I, his I, He was at that awards, that that pointless awards <laughs> too that nobody really cares about last week. Yeah, I, I, I see he gets everywhere. The one Jeremy Cross said it. That, Jeremy yeah, Cross says, everywhere. Uh, yeah, amazing. The gold, the sorry, man, he was the one who coined the uh, goldfish. He was the one who coined the goldfish bowl uh, about Newcastle that time, wasn't it? They, they had a yeah. great song, Newcastle fans, when he went back with Tottenham, and uh, I think Newcastle were three one up, and Newcastle fans sang three one to the goldfish bowl. So they, they, <laughs> that was good, good original chart, and also um, a good day out, I'm sure, for the Geordies. Samuel Prison Geordies, what's going on? Has he had a funny turn? Um, Ty, we'll just end it with a bit more game chat. I'll not give Samuel a chance to respond because we are running out of time. Um, obviously, Samuel's talked about uh, Victor Osham in there at Napoli, and he, he's a he's such an exciting striker. We've saw him in the Champions League this season. He's got 21 goals, um, and I think in 26 appearances. You kind of weigh him up against Kane, and they're going to be the two most sought after strikers this summer. Which way would you lean, and in what camp would you be, really? Because I think. Samuel, would you probably be with Kane judging that answer? I probably would be. Where would you stand, Tyrone, and between those two players? I think right now Kane is probably the bigger guarantee, but I would lean towards Osserman purely from a a, a, a squad building and an age profile point of view, to be honest. If, if you sign Kane, then at the start of next season, and I know this is a bit Klopp-esque in terms of what he said last week, but as much as that was aimed to wind United fans up, it, it does... You know, he does kind of have a point. You'd, you'd go into next season with De Gea. De Gea will be 32 at the night and start next season. Varane, 30. Um, Shaw, 28. Casemiro, 31. Eriksen, 31. Fernandez just about to turn 29. Kane, 30. It's very much a... You know, you, you sign Kane, and then in the next three to four years at most, you've got to sign a new goalkeeper, a new world-class centre-back, a new world-class defensive midfielder, and another world-class forward. You're not you're not giving yourself much kind of room for for squad building, and you sign Kane, and you mentioned that 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 team I've just mentioned, that team would have to win the league or the Champions League within the next two years to make all of those transfers a success. I think if if you're going to spend that money on Varane, on Casemiro, on Kane, you've just you've got to win the league within two years because if you go two years without winning it, and you've got Casemiro 33, Kane 33, Varane 31. You know, the, the, at least one or two of those might be past their best and 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 going the other way. So, 
I would go for for Osserman purely because he could be a United striker for seven or eight years, whereas in reality, Kane might be for three or four years. And like Samuel said, his his injury record to me is a red flag at, at 30 years of age to be signing a striker like that on that sort of money because his his ankles have been absolutely battered over the years. And I don't think anyone really knows at what point it, it's going to catch up with him. We've already seen that he looks... You know, he's he's lost a little bit of a yard of pace. He's a little bit more sluggish at times in games and and things like that. When you've had the injuries he do, he has, and, and on the same body part, it, it, there can be a point where you have a summer, you come back in August, and it's just gone. Something has just gone, and I think it, it would be a, a riskier signing because because of that. I think so. I would go to Osman purely because I think even if it takes him a year to yeah, sell, I, I think long term you'll get you'll get more out of him than Kane. To play devil's advocate then, guys, I actually looked at Osherman's injury record not too long ago. And I, I did a piece on it, but I think it was actually worse than Kane's as as in days off. Um, he had quite a bad injury, to be fair, when he was younger and his teens, I think 16, 17. So that obviously accounts for, for quite a lot. But that's just something to bear in mind um, that mm-hmm. he might not be as robust as, as people think. Um, some bad news for you, for you both and for the listeners. I'll be off next week because I'm going to the Cheltenham Festival oh. and I've got a few days off. So you'd be without us on both podcasts. So you're disappointed. Do you have any tips, Stephen? Any tips? Uh, Samuel, I, I do class you as a friend, so I wouldn't want to make you lose money. So I'm not going to give you any tips. <laughs> I'll put you away. i put you away. Um, so kind. thank you very much for your time, Samuel. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Tyrone, as usual. Thank you, Stephen. Enjoy next week as well. One of the best days out of the year, that fantastic, fantastic yeah. week. I'll be yeah, like a little nice. kid at Christmas on that Tuesday. I certainly will. Um, <laughs> thanks to listeners as usual. Check out the YouTube channel uh, all across the other audio platforms, Spotify and Apple Podcasts and whatnot. Have a great weekend and enjoy the game. Take care.